Ladies and gentlemen, sit down for a second. Look around you. Feel the wonders of your life and feel the wonders of the world. Do, do not take anything for granted. Think about where they come from, why they are here, the purpose of things, how things came to be, what is happening. Well, for just a second while you watch this video, why don't you try and become a philosopher? Hello fellow plot questers, it is I, Aaron the Plot Quester, and today I got this great book, Sophie's World, The History of Philosophy, the number one international bestseller by Jostin Garner, Garder, Garder, no clue how to pronounce the name, and well, let's get right on to it. So today, I will be talking about three of the main philosophers that appear in this book, I mean, there's pretty much a million of them, but Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle are very, very important. By the way, I know Socrates is correct, I know Plato is correct, Plato, Plato, and Aristotle, Arist Aristotle, Aristotle, that, you know what, just bear with me and you can yell at me all you want in the comment section. So, well, let's really get into it. So, I want to start with Socrates. Wisest is she who knows, she does not know. Only thing, the only thing I know is that I know nothing. So, Socrates is pretty much like that eccentric, crazy teacher guy who never really does anything in his classes. What he did instead of lecturing like the typical professor or teacher, he discussed. He genuinely seemed to want to learn from the people he was talking to. He would sit in the middle of Athens, I, I, just show us the pronunciations, okay? And Socrates would just sit there, see someone passing by, and ask him or her questions. Questions that made them doubt their own logic. Questions that made them doubt their own existence. And he tried to learn what he could from them. For he knew that he knew nothing, and he wanted to learn. He was genuinely a philosopher who wanted nothing but to learn. He didn't take money, or he didn't ask for money either, and he just all he did was sit down, talk, discuss, and he just loved to pursue knowledge. And that was Socrates. However, Soon enough, people grew tired of him, and they disposed of him the quickest way possible, an execution. And Socrates didn't run or hide or beg for mercy. He simply said, okay, and he died. Why did he have to die though? Why? Because people, well, the world is stupid in that way, and apparently it has been for the past couple thousand years or a couple hundred thousand years. I'm, I'm just kidding a couple thousand years and whoop life sucks and I feel like okay the thing is I really like of course I'm not like that because I guess Socrates is like what a philosopher is really supposed to be in the base because Socrates is like okay I know nothing I need to learn 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 and I will never stop learning sort of thing well for me I'm just not not saw Socrates type of person, I guess, but I can definitely respect what his ideals were because obviously, one day, one day when he when he stood up and one day when he listened, he became a very very wise man. So I can respect that. And also, there's a story about Socrates where some person called him the smartest, wisest person in Athens, and he was like, "And eh, no." And he went to visit someone in Athens that he thought was the smartest. However, that the wisest or smartest person in Athens that Socrates thought was couldn't answer his questions. Couldn't answer his questions. So Socrates realized, oh, I am the wisest one here. Okay. And he didn't brag, he didn't get arrogant, he, that's, that's all he did. And then he questioned people more like he usually did. Interesting guy, I know. And so... If you found Socrates interesting, 
you'll find uh, his apprentice interesting as well, Plato. Plato believed in a mold or form for all things. For example, a horse had legs. It had four legs. It could run. It, it could be brown or it could be white and it had eyes and its head was shaped in, in, in some sort of shape and it had a barrel-like chest and body and a, and a long tail. There is a, some sort of form that we think of when we think horse. And there are so many other things like we think fish, then we're immediately going to think scales, water, I don't know, some sort of color, eyes, fins. Skills. So he thought that there was some sort of mold for every single thing in the world. And he thought that all these molds or ideas of things that existed, existed in another world. A world that he called the world of ideas. And he also believed that the soul of the human being was immortal. And that soul, before it came into this human body and inhabited it, was in the world of ideas. And when it, be, when it goes in the human body, something begins to occur, begins to recall and wonder. The perfect forms of each and every object that the human sees. And the soul will always yearn for that. The perfect, the mold of every single thing in the world. Now that's what Plato thought, and honestly, like his logic, because this is like before science and before everything else, and the way people think, because you can you can sort of get that, you know, you can get that, you understand where he's coming from, and it makes sense. The reasoning, the logic, it's not, it's not like ineffutable, but it makes sense. It's illogical, and it could be still. You could still believe in that theory. I don't really, but the reason for that is downstairs, Aristotle came a knocking. So let's move on, shall we? Aristotle, if Plato was the philosopher that shut everything out and yearned, yearned for the perfect forms, then Aristotle didn't shut his eyes, he opened them, and he looked around and saw the world around him with all of his senses. And he thought that Plato had it the opposite way. Now, I actually agree with Aristotle on this, hear me, hear me, hear us out. Basically, he said that, first off, you're wrong, Plato. People look around and see, for example, a horse, and he, they see another horse, and another horse, a lot of horses, and then the idea of a horse surfaces, and then a sort of mold for the horse, an idea of the horse, becomes present in the mind. Of course, of course, ideas exist, and molds do exist, or so Aristotle believed. However, these molds, these ideas of the object, or whatever it is, didn't didn't exist beforehand as a perfect thing. It was created with our senses, with our perception of vision, with everything that we saw. And I feel like this makes a lot more sense because I feel like as we observe things, and for example, imagine there was a one-year-old child next to me, okay? And imagine if a dog came out of nowhere and started flying. Who would be surprised? Me or the child? Probably me. Because the child probably hasn't seen enough dogs to know they don't fly. I have. And this is because in my head, the mold of a dog is, is that it barks. It might be fluffy or it might be scary. And it might, it might be really, really cute or not so much. And it definitely can't fly. So... That idea was created after seeing a lot of different dogs. 
So that's what, and that's what Aristotle was saying, and I definitely 100% agree with that. So that's Aristotle's thing. And I find it really, really cool that Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, you know, just sort of handed down a bad end to each other, and they're, and they're considered three of the most influential, the most important philosophers of all time. I, I, at least in ancient times, anyway. And their thinking influenced many, many thinkers throughout the ages. Throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the Renaissance, throughout the Enlightenment. And their philosophy became the base of many, 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 many men and women who sought the same things that they did. Truths. How we came to be. Things knowledge, things that a philosopher must grasp. And they easily could be said, easily could, could be said as the start of these things. Philosophers are the seekers of knowledge, of truth, of fundamental things of how we came to be. And Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle were the most basic, the most ideal philosophers that you could probably find in a close distance. They were the three philosophers that completely shook the way people thought at the time. And they are the three philosophers who first, who weren't the first after all, but they are the three philosophers who put their reasoning and minds to use and started a sort of, I guess, sort of, I don't know, different profession for philosophy? I don't know. But I feel like they're really like the ideal philosopher like I just said. And although not much is known about them now, because you know, they lived a million, I, I, I don't know, like a couple, a, at least a couple thousand years ago. And so we definitely don't know what sort of food they, they like, or what sort of real personality they have. All we know is from books, and we all, we know, we all know that history is not exactly 100% accurate when it comes to that far back. So this is what we know. The knowledge and their thinking that they have lost behind. And I think that is a beautiful thing. Don't you think? And like always, your plot quester, Aaron the plot quester. Thanks for watching, guys, and have a great day. Goodbye.